AP Biology, Chapter 37, Plant Nutrition, Part 1. Plant Nutrition. Today we're going to talk about some of the nutritional needs of plants. Plants are autotrophs. That means they make their own food. Autotroph, auto means self, troph means feeder, autotroph means self-feeder. Doesn't mean they're autonomous, though. They do need some things from the environment. Plants need sun as an energy source. As long as the sun is shining, plants can do photosynthesis. They're converting that energy into chemical compounds. They also require inorganic or non-carbon-based compounds. Now, you might notice there's carbon and carbon dioxide. Uh, there are non-living sources of carbon dioxide, so that's kind of in a gray area as far as inorganic or organic. However, water, minerals, and carbon dioxide uh, are things plants need to get from their environment. Macronutrients. Remember, macro means big. So these guys need, uh, plants need these nutrients in very large amounts. And you do have to memorize these and what they're um, used for. We have carbon oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. These are the macronutrients, and plants need a lot of it in order to uh, make their parts. Let's go ahead and uh, copy down this table. This entire table needs to be known. This is probably the most uh, difficult thing to know for Chapter 37. Carbon is used for synthesis. Remember that photosynthesis takes the carbon dioxide and makes PGAL, uh, three-carbon sugar, and from that we make our glucose. So. You're going to have a lot of carbon in plants from the carbon stored uh, as organic molecules like sugar as a product of photosynthesis. Remember that the cell walls are made of, of sugars, glucose, and glucose has six carbons in it, and those six carbons came from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So there's going to be a lot of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen in plants just because there's a lot of those things in sugars, which is what most of a plant is made out of, cell walls and other parts. The carbon and the oxygen come from the atmosphere, and you need to know that. Carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. The hydrogen, however, is coming from water in the soil. The next one is what's found on a bag of fertilizer, NPK. Nitrogen is uh, needed to make things like proteins and nucleic acids. Remember, nucleic acids have a nitrogen base for DNA. That's adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. For proteins, we have amino acids making up proteins. And if you remember the general structure of an amino acid, we have an NCC backbone where the functional group is coming off the middle carbon. So we need nitrogen to make our proteins, the amino acids, NCC, and we also need it for the nitrogenous bases. And if you can, you know, again, guess, if we didn't have enough nitrogen in the soil, the plant can't make proteins, things like enzymes that carry out chemical reactions. They can't make DNA, so if they're making new cells, they wouldn't be able to make new DNA because they don't have enough nitrogen to do that. So these things are really important to growing plants. And we find nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in soil and fertilizer, so they don't get that from the air. Phosphorus is used for nucleic acids. Remember that the sugar phosphate backbone of DNA and RNA have uh, phosphorus in it. We have ATP, which stands for adenosine triphosphate. So we have three phosphates, or uh, phosphorus, in ATP. And then we have um, phospholipids. Phospholipids have a phosphate head that's polar, attracted to the water, and then the fatty acid tails are hydrophobic, or afraid of the water. Remember, these things arrange themselves in an automatic bilayer where the phosphate heads are attracted to the inside water and outside water. So you can imagine, without phosphorus, you couldn't make phospholipids. You couldn't make cell membranes. And then potassium. Remember, we talked about potassium in uh, Chapter 36. It's involved with stomach control. Uh, we're going to talk about potassium for people, but that's coming up after plants. And water balance and uh, controlling how much water goes in and out of the plant. Uh, they're going to use potassium, kind of like what they do with the stomates, where they have a co-transport mechanism with a proton pump that allows uh, potassium to be pumped to high concentrations, creating a hypertonic solution where water moves to through by osmosis. Then the uh, last three here, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Calcium is used in cell walls. That's kind of a minor thing. Uh, membrane structure, again, that's kind of minor. Uh, regulation also, uh, it's used in some of the uh, negative feedback mechanisms within a plant. Magnesium is the center, in the center of a chlorophyll uh, molecule. And without magnesium, you can't make chlorophyll. And if you can't make chlorophyll, you can't capture light energy. Can't capture light energy, well, good luck doing photosynthesis. Remember something similar, we have something called uh, iron in the middle of our hemoglobin. Uh, protein. And without hemoglobin, we can't carry oxygen throughout the, our body. And if we couldn't do that, then, you know, you can't do cell respiration. So magnesium and iron in humans are important metals that are Im uh, important for the proper folding of different uh, molecules or the arrangement of different molecules. 
Remember that magnesium is something called a cofactor. If it's a cofactor, it's inorganic. It sounds like a name off the periodic table. If it's a coenzyme, it's a vitamin, and it's organic with a carbon backbone. And the last uh, macromolecule that you need to know is sulfur. Now remember what sulfur is used for in proteins. Is it for the primary, secondary, or tertiary structure of a protein? Think about it. The answer would be tertiary structure. Remember the final folding of most proteins, like insulin, is a result of hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions. It's also a uh, result of ionic bondings, uh, hydrogen bonds, and disulfide bridges. So those sulfur groups on the R groups hanging off the middle carbon of the NCC backbone of the amino acids is going to bind to another sulfur and help the protein fold. And remember, enzymes are mostly proteins, so they're going to help the enzymes fold as well. Pause at this point and copy down this table. All right, let's talk about some issues as far as uh, soil. Silicate-based soil are low in uh, phosphorus, can be acidic. Basically, we have uh, excess of hydrogen ions, and uh, that makes something very acidic. That acid lowers the pH. Remember, going lower than 7 is making something acidic. Higher than 7 is a base. And um, we have a scale between uh, 0 and 14. If we have acidic soils, that uh, has some problems for plants uptaking nutrients that we're going to talk about later. So we can neutralize the acids by adding lime. Now, we're not talking about limes like uh, at the grocery store. We're talking limestone. And limestone is a type of sedimentary rock that's basic. And then when you crush it and add it to the, uh, the soil, it um, increases the pH. So you can neutralize acidic soils by adding a base like lime. Let's go ahead and write that down. Uh, acid soils neutralized by adding a base like lime. And that's what you need to know about that. All right, micronutrients. Now, the good news is you don't have to memorize the micronutrients. And these are primarily cofactors, which means that they're, they sound like things off the periodic table. They don't have carbon as a, a backbone. Plants only require them in small amounts, but they still do require them. We have things like chlorine, iron, manganese, boron, zinc, copper, nickel. So the kind of questions you're going to get on a test or quiz is which one of the following is a macronutrient or which one of the following is a micronutrient. If you know the macronutrients, you can identify the micronutrients. So if I ask you which one of the following is not a macronutrient and I put down on it something like carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and um, iron, well, if you know the macronutrients, then you know the iron one kind of sticks out, and that's the one you choose is the one that's not a macronutrient. The same way it works for micronutrients. If there's a, a question about which one's not a micronutrient, and then you get like chlorine, iron, manganese, and boron, which you don't have to memorize. However, you should know the macronutrients. If there's another one that says like uh, man, man, magnesium, then of course you would choose magnesium because that is a macronutrient involved with making chlorophyll. Now again, you also have to know what it's used for, and where it comes from. So that's kind of a lot of chapter 37. All right, moving on. We have uh, nutrient deficiencies, lack of essential nutrients, exhibit specific uh, symptoms. You don't have to know these uh, specifically. However, a healthy leaf is green. Uh, if there's a phosphate deficiency, there's like a purple edge to the leaves. Uh, potassium deficiencies, we got this kind of like red edge to the leaves. And nitrogen deficiencies, we have like a red middle and then green edges to the leaves. So these are different, um, kind of like a plant doctor, a botanist would be able to, uh, you know, figure out what the deficiency is based on the color of the leaves. The way they find this out is they have one plant that's lacking one of the nutrients, like phosphates. They deliberately put the plant in that and see what happens. It's a controlled experiment. They change one variable, the nutrient, and then the dependent variable is what happens to the leaves as a result. It's all the process of science. So here we have a magnesium deficiency. This is the only one that you need to know. I do want you to know magnesium deficiency. So it's a, uh, something called chlorosis, and I do need you to write this down. Chlorosis is a yellowing of the leaves, and it's caused by a magnesium deficiency. So why would that be a problem? Why would those leaves turn yellow? Think about that for a second. Magnesium's function is to uh, make chlorophyll. It's going to be central to the chlorophyll uh, porphyrin ring. And if you don't have magnesium, you can't make chlorophyll. You can't make chlorophyll, well, your plants are not going to be green. 
That's the reason why the plants are green is because of that chlorophyll. So that yellowing is a result of not being able to make chlorophyll because you don't have magnesium to make it. All right, here's chlorophyll, and here's magnesium. This is the porphyrin ring I was just talking about, and you've seen this slide before in the second quarter. Then we have the two fatty acid tails. Remember, this is embedded within the little pancakes here called thylakoids. That's inside the chloroplast, where the light reactions in the Calvin cycle take place, and this is all within a plant cell in the mesophyll layer. interesting that uh, in chlorosis uh, it shows up in the older leaves first the plant will actually move the uh, magnesium to the higher leaves where it's closer to the light and uh, kind of sacrifice the lower leaves so that's the reason why that uh, it shows up in the older leaves first all right this ends part one of your notes on chapter 37